Guten Abend, ähm, herzlich willkommen zum letzten Talk in der Reihe Political Futures im Jahr 2018. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir heute Abend Simon Rees zu Gast haben. Einige von Ihnen kennen ihn vielleicht noch aus seiner Zeit als Director for Strategic Development am MAC, Museum für Angewandte Kunst in Wien. Danach ist er in seine Heimat Neuseeland gegangen und war Direktor, und jetzt muss ich auf meinen Zettel schauen, der Govett Brewster Art Gallery in New Plymouth. Das ist nichts anderes als das erste Museum für zeitgenössische Kunst in Neuseeland. Seit einigen Wochen ist er wieder in Wien und wir freuen uns sehr, dass er heute Abend zu einem sehr politischen Thema sprechen wird, nämlich die sogenannte Low Trust Society bzw. im Plural Societies und inwiefern nicht auch der Kunstbetrieb geprägt ist von dieser Idee des begrenzten Vertrauens. Thank you Simon for Danke being vielmals. here with us and yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Danke. Uh, first of all, many thanks to Vanessa and Nicolas for the invitation to speak within the framework of the Political Futures series here at the Kunsthalle Wien. And under the aegis of the exhibition Antarctica, an exhibition on alienation, currently sh on show above us. I have over the years in disparate spaces and geographies spoken on aspects of alienation from a range of perspectives and including at the invitation of Nicolaus. He once publicly referred to me as Mr. Periphery, which is all too true. Uh, um, didn't mention that I also lived in Vilnius, which is somehow peripheral as well as New Zealand, Australia, the west coast of the United States. Or maybe after this talk, I can add the moniker Mr. Alienation. Who can tell? With this in mind, I show you one of my few slides this evening, a painting by New Zealand's artist hero, Pache national artist, Colin McCann, Am I Scared, from 1976. McCann overheard the words, Am I Scared, Boy A, from his office in the years he spent in New Zealand's major metropolitan art museum, the Auckland Art Gallery, as first chief curator and deputy director, respectively. The words were uttered by a young Maori boy describing his discomfort to a classmate at visiting the museum on a school trip. Likely from the lower socioeconomic rungs, contemporary art or European art generally wasn't for him. It wasn't his cup of tea. It's a stark reminder of what institutions have to overcome to play a useful social role and how they have to strive to limit the extent to which art, in itself and in its setting, is alienating to many or some audiences. Anyways, it is worth noting I am speaking to you this evening as an EU alien. The official Brussels terminology in English for immigrants to the European Union from outside its borders. Ironically, The terminology is softer in German, simply EU Auslander. And at German-speaking borders, we present ourselves to alle passer controls, while in the United Kingdom and in Ireland, we're others, which is in the post-identity politics age a more loaded term. I digress, and again, I'm glad to be here and at this uh, Advent time to have an audience. For many years, criticism, it has seemed to me and to my mentor in the terrain, Paul Foss, is a matter of having something to say and knowing when to say it. A matter of timing my wife, Nicole, took issue with this morning, considering I am currently job hunting. Never mind. In the text accompanying the exhibition I have currently organized for the Society of Projective Aesthetics at Georg Kagel Fine Arts, I write that exhibiting institutions produce, and I quote myself, a paucity of communication about content and context as core values, which might be cynical and self-preserving 
in this new age of populist politics. What I'm saying is that I don't think many institutions want to piss off their principal funders and funding agencies. I'd hardly be living up to my own rhetoric if I didn't express a value-laden talk here, which is what I hope I'm about to do. The subject of the talk evolved from, my, from anecdotal conversations about my experiences with Austria's governmental agencies or bureaucracy, its civil service, please keep the English term and its ironical couching in mind, over the course of this summer as my family and me re-registered as residents here in Vienna. My family as Austrians and me as a returning alien who had been granted residence rights in Austria previously and had lived in the European Union from 2003 until the beginning of 2014. I'm just showing you this because it's one of my, my favorite artworks of the 20th century. And the message from Sister Carita Kent can just sit over my shoulder, as can its color coding. Um, some of my love of the image is personal because I'm blind in one eye, so my monocularity sort of um, keeps me connected to um, I love. When I sat, and then, during the summer, I sat in, the auditor, in an auditorium listening to two former diplomats referred to in the promotional abstract about this talk. I could hardly believe my ears. As every criticism leveled at the nation states and cultural spaces they were talking about could be re-leveled at Austria, as I had experienced it over the preceding days and weeks that could definitely be typified by the concept of low trust. I had um, Francis Fukuyama um, definition of trust here and um, the overall sense of low trust is borrowed from his book um, that you see which followed the book on the end of history um, which was written and published in 92 in 1995. Um, you'll find um, in spaces of high journalism like the New York Times, New Yorker, Financial Times, Die Zeit, um, The Guardian, over the last two years they've been applying um, this term low trust and low trust society in a sort of more carte blanche way than the economic um, and foreign affairs couching that Fukuyama, writing from the perspective uh, at that time of the Rand Corporation, um, was referring to. Remember, I am speaking not as a new or recent immigrant to Austria, but as somebody who has been through the experience before and can compare what it meant for me in 2010 through 2014 and what it means in 2018. Under different governments and different administrative leadership, at my point of arrival in 2010, under the first Feynman Grand Coalition, that's the SPÖVP, in that case the SPÖ um, in the leading space, um, and when the SPÖ held the offices of the Ministry of Internal Affairs that enveloped at that time immigration and integration, only to have a coalition switcheroo in 2011 and the responsibility for the newly minted integration ministerium be held under uh, a, the, the offices of a certain Sebastian Kurtz. The writing was on the wall. As I weave this narrative, I'm acutely aware of what psychologists call the fundamental attribution error or the tendency to blame others for your own faults or negative experiences. Meaning that people tend to overstress the importance of dispositional or personality-based explanations for the actions and experiences of others while playing down contextual explanations. When we observe others, the person concerned is the primary reference point whereas we are more often aware of surrounding forces when we observe ourselves or our own experiences. A 
According to the founder of behavioral science, J.G. Miller, the more individualistic the society, the more likely it is to commit the fundamental attribution error, which clearly puts the art world into an extreme category of its own. And we've all had um, run-ins with disgruntled critics who were failed artists or failed artists, um, um, you know, per se. In saying this out loud, I acknowledge that my experiences are common as an immigrant, that is, or EU alien, and while exasperating, they aren't life-threatening or of the magnitude of the experiences of asylum seekers or those immigrants fleeing theatres of war, climate instability and starvation. They might reside somewhere in the territory of a conversation I sat on the edges of during the final break in a tennis tournament I played during the summer. In the conversation, a group of my fellow players complained about the increasing use in Austria and its press of colour typifiers in the language of politics and in the media's description of the political parties comprising the government. You see, colour signification was wrecking havoc with their tennis uniforms. If Schwarz-Blau or Türkis-Blau has taken on resolutely ultra-conservative, even neo-fascistic overtones, how could they reasonably wear those colours on court? I've opted for some green here this evening, and you know, um, hence. Um, any tennis fans amongst you will understand that turquoise is one of Rafael Nadal's staple colours, and therefore a staple in the kit of Rafa fans on tennis courts all over Europe. And I wonder what the members of one of Vienna's most venerable tennis clubs named Schwarzblau on the Rustenschaka Allee have been thinking about their nomenclature since the last election. What I'm proposing here is humour as a reflexive tool. But people really had a conversation about how the hell can they wear turquoise or black or blue anymore on the tennis court. Um, I'm just reporting something anecdotal. Um, also, I am making fun of myself and an acknowledgement of my luxury problems or a little later, what might be called first world problems. Humour can potentially be harnessed as an institutional tool for overcoming audience alienation. We all understand what a joke is. Or couching a broader sweep of critique in a way that's more easily read or intuited by the mainstream. That said, if they don't get it, you've produced another problem. I wonder aloud here about the Kunsthaler's logo suite of eagles, for instance. This isn't to say that what we might consider matters of privilege cannot be instrumental or to be instrumentalized within matters of trust and distrust. For the four months I've been back in Austria, I have had numerous observations or questions along the lines of, why would you leave New Zealand and come back to Europe right now? Embodied within the question is a long-time projection of New Zealand as a paradise and a more recent projection relative to the current Jacinda Ardern-led socialist or social democratic government of a social paradise. Let's call it red-pink. The question also encloses Europe's current state of political crisis. What is misunderstood is that New Zealand is anything but red-pink, as the financialization of housing has become its core social value. And home ownership and private property is its principal means of social legitimization and advancement. Try being taken seriously at your average dinner party or tennis court conversation if you're not a homeowner or striving to become one, as was the experience of Nicole and me in the last four years. Those who benefit the most largely advanced this aspect of socio-political identification and aspiration, meaning the banks, finance companies, construction companies, 
facilitated by government programs such as first homeowners grants and right to buy schemes. There's a sense in which this instrumentalization of property ownership is a neoliberal or populist, and there's the first time I use that word, social victory, as it invests in the many, therefore, their many homes owned, away from older structures and networks of advancement, such as private schools, universities, and clubs. Maybe there is some roseate hue in all of that, pink, red, that is. In this sense, the New Zealand experience is a version of populism, representing a perceived transfer of power to the many from the few. It is only a perception, however, it is, as it is concentrated financial power with the lending institutions enabling property ownership through mortgages and aligning that power with government. And those various dinner tables unable to take me seriously to lend me recognition were evincing a sense of low trust producing a barrier to social entry because social recognition which used to be conducted on an aristocratic, class, military, or religious plane, now takes place on the economic plane. One has to marshal one's personal financial resources as an extension of the value recognition of personal resources paid in salary or wages, in such a way to meet social values. Hopefully I'm building a word picture, and there are some more words on the screen for you to read from Fukuyama. Hopefully I'm building a word picture in which the situations of Austria, the crisis in populism, and the spaces in which institutions of art can act is starting to emerge. Austria is certainly a society that in fits and starts from 1848 to 1919 to 1945 and through the Marshall Plan years has started to act on an economic plane. Fits and starts, mind you. As recognition and social value has begun to reside there and when different social problems persist when older planes are principal reference. For instance, the way aristocracy abides despite its constitutional dismantling in 1919. And I guess the eagle in the logo suite pokes some fun at this. Populism has, since its broader identification and definition in the 1970s, and being understood to be a sort of collective mobilization or a reinvestment via democratic means, that is plebiscite, the, the four yearly or three yearly vote, in the many, so an investment in the many and away from the few though it has always been in crisis. Its claims to be non-elitist have become even more problematical in the age of the old Etonian Brexiteers. The billionaires like Berlusconi and the silver-spooned millionaires like Trump, all of whom claim to represent the people and especially workers. Problematical for the current Austrian government in this regard is the identification of the Chancellor Kurtz with the Catholic Church and his time spent in university as a member of a Catholic Studentverbindung and the more wholesale problem of the FBÖ's grounding and the Burschenschaften. These were, after all, clubs founded to give the lower middle class and middle class a leg up into joining the few. Nevertheless, the greatest inherent challenges to populism or um, its most recent and, dare I say, reactionary aspect is now referred to as nativism, which is a sort of nationalism for the few again. It's the Austria for Austrian cant of the FBO and the anti-immigrant, anti-asylum and anti-Islam cant of many more European political parties and movements. Dialectically, it is a move from many back to a few, therefore seems in itself to be anti-populist. The greatest problem I had with the immigration process I started talking about um, this summer 
was the negative neo-xenophobic attitudes directed by the functionaries and the different government agencies responsible for schooling, kindergarten and welfare towards my children who happened to be their fellow Austrian citizens. So no discrimination towards them should abide. It felt it is their bureaucratic judgment was based on an earlier era of blood purity. Never mind the fact that their father is Anglo-Saxon. The children were penalized, and my difficult with those agencies, much more difficult for the sake of their father being an EU alien. Their Staatsbürgerschaft had no play in the matter. Now, many of the problems of Austrian identification, including those embodied in the FPÖ and OVP's project, are to do with empire and its loss. A loss that has been almost overcome by the expansionist Austrian banking sector, it must be said. Now, the most cogent section as I read it in Hart and Negri's book, Empire, is the reading of Franz Fanon's analysis of coeval master-slave relations and their mutual reliance. Essentially, empires require vassal states to prove their self-worth, and the vassal states need the reflective glory of the empire for theirs. Austria was great when its citizenry, therefore, was multicultural, multi-religious, and polyglot. Turning a back to that reality is turning a back on those glories and their reflection. There's a saying that a true Viennese is half Austrian and a quarter Hungarian and a quarter Bohemian, or Berman Meyer, to put it culture in, in the German. And at an earlier moment, those people may have spoken one of those languages in concert with the Viennese inflected German. There was a dialect. And as we know, Vienna was built as a model imperial capital, which after 1848, and then the commissioning of the Ring Project by Franz Josef in 1857, has positioned itself as an imperial heart dedicated to civil and representative institutions, including museums, and the offices of a civil service large enough to administer that empire. These institutions and offices, to a great extent, were modelled after those of London and the British Commonwealth. If the Ringstrasse itself was in the thrall to Hausmann's Paris, as was the World Fair of 1873, inspired by a visit of the Kaiser to his cousin, Prince Albert, to the Crystal Palace in London. It's no small irony that the British consider the Westminster system their gift to the world. Even at the moment, they are intending to withdraw from it and are caught in their own battle with the antinomies of neoliberalism, populism, and nativism. In fact, every cogent description of a civil society, and I poked ironically at the idea of an Austrian civil service earlier, and whether you, you can take your pick of which academic critic or commentator is writing it up, includes offices and aspects of social and institutional capital, definition of social capital over my shoulder, that extends and balances political democracy, parliament, the legislature, and government. Those offices tend to be referred to in terms of state broadcaster, and here it's um, ORF, independent universities and technical institutions, state subsidized libraries, museums, galleries, and theaters. And at an earlier moment across Europe, and still in France, Britain, and to some extent Germany, and definitely the nations of the Commonwealth, those institutions play this role, checks to power, and harnessing public language. Here in Austria, when a high proportion of senior civil servants, service roles are appointed along party lines, including in the cultural sector, it dilutes this civility and cuts across the concept that social capital 
is embodied within mutual self-interest. And you can see that definition um, in Fukuyama's text. Surely the concept that we, meaning those of us here in this room, describe and adhere to as the art world operates in such a way, um, as does most of the more broadly imagined cultural sector. So, collectively, what is good for us and good for art and a surely international polyglot and opinionated is good for the many. It is a balance to the legislature, uh, plebiscite and elected government. In that spirit, at least in Britain, we can witness full page advertisements taken in the leading newspapers in the name of collectives or leading institutions and their directors protesting or making a point politically and in self-interest. Who can remember such a sense of social capital being engendered here in Austria since the governmental crisis of 2000, even though we might contend that today's crisis is deeper? Therein lies the one answer to the question of where and how the art and its institutions can act and rebuild trust. If no such collectivity can be achieved, then ensuring messages about context and content are high on the agenda of single institutions, such as this one, and equally that they can support or commission artists and practitioners who produce and champion such content, then at least small steps can be taken in rebuilding balance and trust. Happily, Today's news includes the amendment of the Rot-Weiss-Rot red-white-red immigration policy, so it operates more wholly, as what I referred to earlier, on the economic plane. It will now recognize the need to employ foreign workers in certain prioritized roles and sectors to fulfill employment demand, including across regional Austria. And in this case, and you can read about it in today's newspaper, it, newspapers, it means waiters, room service staff, and fruit and vegetable pickers, and not just doctors and nurses. You may have read with the long summer, it's been the largest ever Austrian apple crop. In fact, it was the same in New Zealand um, in their, their summer of 2018, and there simply aren't enough people to pick the fruit which could fulfill international demand. Well, it's hard for me to swallow Francis Fukuyama's neoliberal language pill. Um, any move away from nativism, so Austrian jobs for a narrow band definition of Austrian people, and towards economic inclusiveness, which represents an increase of trust, is a positive. Moreover, we can read that the selection going forward of the commissioner, curator, practitioner teams responsible for the Venice, Venice Pavilion is moving to proposal and jury-based selection and away from ministerial appointment, embodying an advancement of social capital relative to the sector. And here's hoping that talks such as this one can play some small role in doing the same. I conclude. I just read in the standard there is an announcement or like an open call for the architecture biennale so everybody can apply yeah. as a team or as an architect with a proposal which I think is quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, I mean I, I was it, really like surprised. Yeah, so so it was written into legislation on Friday afternoon so it hit the you know, news on Sunday for the Monday, Monday papers. And it did seem to be an advancement in social capital and collective good. And uh, did seem to be ironical that it was under an ERFLP minister, not an SPU minister. So um, I wanted to conclude with those two pieces of news which seem positive. Um, of course, it, it, I've never quite understood in this um, 
governmental turn towards populism, why the banks which do um, operate in an expanded Habsburgian territory, and it's good for them to have that sort of reconstituted empire, haven't put more pressure on the government, even when it is conservative, to reflect the same sets of values. Because um, neoliberal victory has usually meant that the banking sector or the central bank and governments will align because that's where they reap the largest profit, you know single largest um, producer of GDP in Britain is banking. It's not goods or s services produced, it's just raw finance. And one could imagine that could take on the same dimension here, if not for fallout of government policy and, you know, that, that expanded realm. So, yeah. Hi, Nicholas. And I'm sorry, sorry for being yeah, late, right. but I, you know, I went, whoa, I have to look, sorry. The, uh, the last edition of the Time magazine um, did a f photo of the cover. Yeah. Uh, they are speaking about, I think populism is much more complex. Uh, yeah. Then uh, it has a lot to do also with uh, the, the people who are standing behind, not politically, not in their political opinion, but more how they, how they, how they, how they act and how the media c uh, uh, collaborate uh, with them. Yeah, Time is uh, the Time magazine. Um, Austria's good-looking, good-looking young chancellor is bringing the far right into the mainstream extreme makeover. This, I think, this means something. It's very, he, he, indeed, he's, you know, I cannot judge if he is good looking, but he is very proper looking. Thing. Yeah. So it doesn't represent necessarily a, um, what we think about a pol politician. And you, are, you moved here from New Zealand recently, half a year ago, and your New Zealand is, uh, has a prime minister, young woman, she, um, relatively young woman, yeah. and good looking. Uh, what is uh, she? She's from a liberal left party, is it? Yeah, it yeah. Right? I, I, I described it as red pink. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, pink red. But she's you know. playing a little bit the same game. Hmm? So with her, you know, she she got a child recently, and oh. yeah, I, I mean, I, I in in terms of low trust, there's another whole dimension that is being written about in relation to uh, the digital sphere. Yeah and the um, alignment in uh, new digital economies. I, I only made the classical alignment of banking sector, property ownership, and central government. Of course, um, there's a new fourth estate, or we could say fifth estate alignment, if you look at digital press, um, with those so, same things which Kurtz is doing. You know, and I would say that, that uh, Straka, by taking on like a junior role as Minister of Sport. However, understood it means he's in a platform to shake hands and speak, you know, and appear in the most read pages in newspapers or the most popular section of a newspaper. You know, allied, allied to that. And I think we all have to double think um, our, our position. With Jacinda Ardern, in as much as um, Donald Trump, um, I, I think the, her digital game, she's very accessible by Twitter and, you know, replies to emails, quite, actually reflects the, small, the, the smallness of the country and the reality that you might bump into her in the supermarket in life. With... Kurtz, because Austria is actually quite a large, you know, territory and Vorarlberg's eight hours away, or with Trump, the Twitter interfaces is clearly a game because you're <coughs> unlikely to actually see the president or engage with the president in a personal space. You know, um, the artist Ken Lum loves telling a story um, of a back packing trip to New Zealand in the early 70s after he got his master's degree. Many of you will know Ken's text work in the secession tunnel. 
how many schnitzels eating, how many deaths from AIDS, how many people kissed, you know, that's, that's Ken's work, where he was walking in front of the New Zealand Parliament and a sort of limousine drove up and parked itself on the pavement right in front of him, giving him a shock. And out jumped Sir Robert Muldoon, the Prime Minister of the day, and he saw the maple leaf on Ken's bag and said, ah, visiting us from Canada, are you enjoying yourself? He said, oh, aren't you the Prime Minister? And he said, yes, my driver's daughter's 21st birthday today, I've given the day off, and frankly, I don't know where the car park is, so I figured that there's Ken, you know, randomly meeting the Prime Minister, which doesn't seem out of place in a country as small as New Zealand. You've been there often and know that. So I think, I think the game's different relative to that. But internationally, of course, Jacinda has become the darling of The Guardian. In fact, on the digital version that I scan daily, there's almost a daily New Zealand story in the main sections. You know, today it's about a new law enacted um, on, on strangulation in marriage outlawing it, you know, apparently used to, you know, law used to give you the scope to do things in the bedroom, um, which could go too far and not be prosecuted because of the bad experience of one New Zealand parliamentarian. Um, that law has been changed because of Jacinda's popularity. That's a story on behalf of all women worldwide and an advancement of feminism playing in The Guardian. So I think that is the sort of harness she has made of being so attractive, being so available, you know, being more attuned to the digital, which is pulling her party into a spotlight away from the conservatives. And that, that's the difference there. Did you talk about language for you as a native English speaker, yeah. um, observing the flattening of uh, the complexity of English? Or, um, it, 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 it just started with Trump, but it's also visible for people like us. But it's also swapping over to other to to, to German. Yeah. Yeah. We, we get uh, quite heavily criticized uh, by the complexity, also from politicians now, by the complexity or the academic style we use uh, in, uh, as an art institution. But how do you, how do you see this? How, do you, how does it feel to you? Does in, in thinking about in, public institutions, not, not here, but English-speaking ones, did this flattening of language uh, entered the art systems. Yeah, I, I think um, I talked about this artwork, which was, you know, uh, words uttered in 1976 by a young Maori boy visiting Auckland Art Gallery because he felt so uncomfortable out uh, there. And uh, dare I say it, it would be as much to do with the lack of explanation or the sort of high white, you know, um, architecture and, and various other anglophone coded things he, he found there. I think that um, I was talking about the need as in, in social capital, the need for more collectivization of will in this sector. The fact that more institutions need to work together if they possibly could to um, express a more common terminology, you know that embodies different audiences. I think the answer to populist government is running elements of populism, and I ex thought that humor could be one of those tools. Humor. humor, which is present in your eagles, for instance, you know. It's pointed, but people understand that it's a way of saying something more aligned to their common language. So I just think it's a, it's a multi-tiered approach to language. I do think that flattening is, um, and the 50 word Twitter bite and the, all the other sort of means of, you know, um, abrupt communication is getting in the way of deeper understanding of things. And I have to agree with you um, there, you know. Um, I think 
that if uh, I, 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 but I observed in, um, in more in Germany than here uh, that institutions describe themselves uh, also not uh, click einfache Sprache click easy language yeah. so in, in theater in theaters and it, yeah. it's it's very strange so me. so you missed me yeah. actually saying that yeah. it's all too yeah. rare that institutions um, uh, highlight uh, content and context in their public language and I commended the Kunsthalle for doing so and for my um, being able to play a role in that so I do think it's cynical that they don't want to annoy their principal funders and the agencies that fund them, you know. Um, and I think that, that, that a collective agreement around um, the fact that we stand for a broader tradition of civil society and civil service um, has to be uh, reconstituted somehow. Who might do that? I don't know. but it, you know, there's enough people who think the same way to somehow launch, launch it. You know. Vanessa, do you know who might send that Sputnik forth? Yeah, and 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 in that embodiment of trust, you know, it, it, it's an abiding problem that we have. Somehow we have our professional sets of ethics, our professional codes, and are recognized as professionals, yet we are not entrusted. You know, there would, the ministry, minister of culture is always a medical professional and speaks to his or her fellows in the profession and makes legislation based on expertise and higher order values. Um, you would hope that um, the domain of culture and our professionalization, and, and let's remember, we have become in the last 30 years ever more professionalized with higher degrees, um, vocational, you know, that, that, that that could somehow be embodied as a core value within inside um, our funders and, and supporters. And I don't have the answer to why that's not the case, but it's just not the case. Christmas time. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have something to add? No? Anyone from. Yeah? Yes. Thanks. Um, thanks for the talk, Simon. Um, I have a question about Fukuyama, your decision to, um, to mention him. And somehow it seems like the whole talk is really based around his issue of trust. Although he's better known as someone who introduced the end of ideology, right? And uh, Zizek has an interesting thing to say. I'm not a big fan of Zizek, but I think that's worthwhile mentioning. He talks about all of us today as Fukuyamas, like we all became like him. Somehow it's difficult to imagine uh, alternative reality, the one that we're living through. What's your take on that? On, on, on Fukuyama's legacy, um, that everybody laughed about him, um, the end of ideology and all of that. But now it seems like it's difficult to, um, even in this talk, is to kind of it, provide um, alternative view on all of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I went to this talk because of, you know, two former diplomats talking about a certain country and its um, barriers to emerging as a full democracy or into being a fully globalized society because of its, its, its low trust. And they use the term, but I was sitting there as a new immigrant or recent immigrant or hoping to be an immigrant, finding that every single thing that was described about, you know, somewhere in the global south applied to Austria today. Um, and I couldn't, I, I still can't understand why the powers that be in Britain who have the most to lose from Brexit 
haven't cozied up closer to the government and exerted influence on them. Lord knows they're the members of the same clubs, they went to the same universities and the same schools and could do so in the same way as I don't understand why the banks which own banking concerns in Poland, former Yugoslavia, you know, all the former Habsburgian territories, you know, haven't done the same with government here because they have the most to lose from nativism. Now, um, Fukuyama, sadly, and he was a right-wing thinker in the pay of the Rand Corporation, um, you know, and his end of history was a convenient sort of footnote to the capitalist advancement of the um, Reagan to Bush years, you know. Um, but what he got correct was the tendency of populist and neoliberal governments to start any story from the start of their term. It is very hard, and Austria is a prime example of this, it is very hard to hear a single story, even from the generation who lived through it, about the critical role of economic rebuilding of the Marshall Plan. You know, Vienna was a city divided and capital from the United States buoyed the economy, economy and rebuilt the economy into the 80s, you know, and from there on a different sort of uh, market logic took hold after Christ, you know, um, the Wagner governments and, and it became successful. So that end of history, the fact that sort of there are moments where Hegelian logic is thrown to the four winds because it's convenient not to refer to it, you know, because each political, um, each government wants to claim its own success and corporations want to claim the, their success and they don't want to mention um, their involvement in earlier, um, could be crimes, you know, or earlier failures. So. In that sense, we are all Fukuyamas because we all participate in this, you know, kind of uh, economy of false memory. Yeah. I just want to reply to that. I think it's really interesting what's happening in France right now. And it's really about... Um, it's a symptom of something that's been going on for a really long time. It seems like that we, as participants, uh, let's say, you know, the art world and so on, um, I think the greatest disappointment I and mean, the shock of the, um, the election of Trump and the Brexit is that somehow it seems to be uh, the return of the repressed. You know, it's like the people who have been forgotten. And, um, it's, it's in small towns. It, we don't have access to it. I have a friend who is an artist who has been doing this series of beautiful watercolors, and they are very picturesque. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Why are you doing this, this work? And he said, you don't understand. These are villages where people vote 90% right wing. And I thought, this is very bizarre to look at these this watercolors. But then I thought, but he's wrong to do these works because what do you know about these people? And that's exactly where it's very difficult somehow to, to, um, to comment on that. Uh, what's happening in France right now, and it's spreading in Italy and maybe further, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it seems to be, um, there is no political party behind it. Um, it seems to be a rebel against um, a lifestyle that um, a lot of people have to live, but they don't want to. So I don't, I'm not saying that you have an answer, it's just a comment um, on, on where, you know, the populist thing might, might lead next, I don't know. Do you? Well, yeah, yeah I, I mean, now, Macron, Sebastian Kurtz is absolutely the case. He is a professional politician. Kurtz. Yeah, Kurtz. He dropped out of university, didn't complete his degree to concentrate on politics. So he's never had a job. 
he's going straight into the administration of the political domain. So these people <laughs> have no stake in the, I hate these terms, but real world, because they don't know about the value of labor or the um, recognition of a personal or social resource aside from the political signifiers that they give them. You know, and that means there can any, um, now Trump's rhetoric is that he's reinvesting in workers and worker representation. But um, it's, it's like Congress, the House of Rep, that there isn't a single worker there. You know, trade unionism in, in um, the United States was broken in the 30s and never re-emerged and there hasn't been a trade union um, allied, you know, uh, politician in Britain uh, since slightly <laughs> before the Second War. Um, and it's kind of the same in France and it's definitely becoming the case in Britain and in the likes of Kurtz and Schlarker, you have it here. So I think it's about the fact that, that there's this very slick Teflon through line in the political system. So if there's any politician who looks like they can better identify or might even have roots in a community or have had their 10 minutes you know, working in their father's factory, they're able to harness that language and empower um, that, you know, that movement or that, that uh, political will. Yeah, it's, uh, it would be, you know, it's, sorry. It's, and in a way, it's en entering another discussion. So uh, I don't think that you can compare all those politicians and not all three of his friends yeah. at all. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a wealthy, rich country. Yeah, yeah. and that makes, makes it different to, uh, you know, there are not such problems uh, in, in, in France or in Germany or in the US. That is why I'm so still so surprised. Okay, it's a whole other discussion. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you yeah. for being and, here. And uh, great that you are back to Vienna. So I'm minutes. leaving. It's one reason to, <laughs> to visit Vienna. We have an opening tomorrow. Preis der Kunsthalle at Karlsplatz, and next week. Uh, Annette Kelm on, oh God, what is it? Thursday, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the 13th. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much.